Hey, what's going on, guys? I think we are live. Uh, I'm going to give it a few minutes just to let some people filter in here because uh, this is kind of an unexpected live stream. Filter in here. Let's see. Pop up chat. Hey, what's happening? What's happening, Jonathan? Okay, so I think we got the chat going. We're live. Uh, yeah, so just doing a, a kind of unexpected live stream today. Uh, something I said I was going to start. Oh, you know, Jonathan, can you hear me? Drop a drop a comment if you can hear me, buddy. Let's see here. Let me just make sure we got audio here real quick. Drop a comment if you can hear me. Okay, so we're, we're good to go here. So yeah, kind of an unexpected uh, live stream. What's up, Khalil? Uh, just kind of wanted to make a video talking about uh, what's up, crypto. Uh, today, kind of wanted to talk about the new YouTube monetization policy. Uh, it's happening, uh, Jay Capola. Um, yeah, I wanted to talk about the new uh, YouTube monetization policy, kind of how it's going to be affecting creators, when it's going to be kicking in, um, how to grow a channel here in 2018 under these new policies, some alternatives to monetizing your content, and actually how, even though I realize this is probably frustrating, um, you know, basically how it can actually kind of help out new creators. So uh, I got kind of a long list of things here we'll cover, um, and then definitely want to kind of open it up to a, a chat and a QA. and uh, a So first off, you know, I'm definitely not one of the biggest YouTubers out there. You know, we have YouTubers with millions of subscribers. And even I think like even hundreds, a couple hundred subscribers, you're kind of YouTube middle class. So I'm, I'm definitely kind of on the uh, lower middle class in terms of uh, YouTubers. What's happening to Mitchie boy? Um, and my hat really goes off to, to YouTubers like Glenn from Hustler Hacks, Reezy Resells, Crypto Bobby, even Kubera. You know, these guys who are putting out a ton of content and also people who are doing like live streams on a daily basis. You know, this is probably like the... I could probably count on one hand the number of live streams that I've, I've actually done. Uh, they actually kind of make me really uncomfortable. I talk too fast and I'm always nervous and stuff like that. Uh, probably doesn't help that I'm always drinking coffee on them either. Um, but yeah, my hat really goes off to those guys. And lately I've been kind of thinking like I, you guys probably hear about, I want to get a silver play button up here. So definitely appreciate this, uh, you know, all the subscribers and everything like that. But I've been kind of asking myself like, how do I get to that hundred thousand, all this type of stuff? And uh, it kind of brought me back to a lot of this, you know, personal development, Jim Brown or Jim Rohn, Les Brown type of stuff. And it's it kind of forced me to do some self-assessment. And am I really the caliber of YouTuber who deserves to have 100,000 subscribers? And I think I'm not really there yet, right? Like the, the production value of my channel, I think it's no secret, could use a little bit of work. I really need to start doing more, more live streams, get more comfortable with these, doing more collaborations to kind of bring over other people's audiences. Um, and kind of a funny thing, I wouldn't be surprised if uh, Reezy Resells drop, drops in here. He's been trying to get me to do a collab for a while. And part of it is he always hits me up on Instagram and I, I never really go on Instagram, so I always miss him. But he, he's a he's a very kind of lively and strong personality. And I'm, I'm almost, to, to be honest, a little bit intimidated to do a live stream with him. Um, I've done a few with a few other guys, but that's been kind of a goal of mine in 2018 is to do a lot more uh, a lot more live stream. So I, I figured I'd kind of start off kind of explaining my journey on YouTube. Uh, I want to get to a thousand subscribers by February 20th. So yeah, Skypilot just brought up an interesting point and, and let me touch on this a little bit. So most of you guys probably know this, but it used to be you had, had actually, if we go way back to what, like pre 2013, at one point you almost had to be invited, right? You were like a YouTube partner. Very few people were monetized. And back then it was a really, really high bar. Well, at some point, YouTube opened up monetization to pretty much everybody. And uh, now I shouldn't say everybody, but to anybody who got to 10,000 views, which really, I mean, it's a challenge, but it's not a huge bar to reach. Um, so, you know, a lot of people were getting uh, YouTube partnerships. Everybody was monetized. And, and something that happens, I think it was Gary. I don't know if Gary is in here. Uh, but Gary shot me an email the other day, and he was like, somebody's re-uploading your content. And I would say lately I've been keeping up with it, but I would say at least two, three, five times a week, um, I'll see people taking my content, re-uploading it, and either trying to get views, trying to get watch time, trying to get subscribers. Sometimes people will put affiliate links below it. 
So if somebody has like a drop shipping course or something like that, or an Amazon FBA course, they'll repost my video, put the link to their course in the description box. And not only are they kind of stealing my views and watch time, but in a way it almost, to, to somebody who doesn't know me and my channel, it almost makes it look like I'm supporting this garbage program that they have all out, that they have out. Um, so really just like that, but that's a significant problem on YouTube. So the 10,000 views was, was kind of meant to tamper down like all that type of stuff going on. So uh, kind of why they've raised the bar. Ultimately, YouTube's algorithm has changed over the years and it used to really heavily favor uh, views, right? And it's really easy to, to buy views. There's a ton of websites that sell views. Any one of us can go on Fiverr and buy like 10,000 YouTube views and likes and subscribers and everything else. But the one thing that bots can't really uh, trick is view time. So that's why there's this new focus on view time. And uh, in terms of subscribers, I think YouTube wants people who are, are like getting an audience that actually cares about them and comes back. Um, because ultimately at the end of the day, YouTube wants you to spend as much time on YouTube as possible and providing a better, by providing a better viewer experience, uh, that's basically how they're going to go about doing that. So, um, that's what kind of what these new policies are meant to do. And in some ways it actually favors new subscribers. Um, reason being, because if you're creating quality content, you're going to get watch time. And if you get watch time, that's going to even put you above a lot of these guys doing clickbait. And a lot of the big mega YouTubers you guys like right now, a lot of them got their start using bots, using clickbait type stuff. And the reason that clickbait can't trick this new type of, uh, this new algorithm is because if I put up a video and it's like, watch this amazing car crash where a hundred people die and you tune into it and it's just, it's a horrible example. I don't know why I said that, but if you tune into it, it's just like me picking my nose or playing with my cat. You're going to watch it for five seconds and tune out. And so in that sense, like, uh, clickbait is not going to get watch time. And that's why watch time is what's really going to drive YouTube engagement and, and you know, them showing your video as a sponsored video or high in search results or whatever else. So, uh, I've had my YouTube channel since 2010. I haven't been a YouTuber since 2010. Uh, basically, you know, we all have to start a YouTube channel, just like you guys have YouTube channels, even if you're not a creator. Um, we all have to start YouTube channels just in order to like comment and create watch lists and everything else. So I guess I created this YouTube channel back in 2010. I don't remember when I started exactly making content, um, but it's kind of funny. I used to, uh, I don't really know why I started. I thought maybe I'd try to make a little bit of money online or maybe was just curious about it. Um, good comments. Don't forget to mention the uh, 24, 240,000 minutes of watch time over a 365 day period. So I'm guessing 240,000 minutes winds up being 4,000 hours. Um, is that right, Sky Pilot? But anyhow, when I used to uh, first started making videos, I would hold my hand over the phone so that the camera couldn't see me. And I would just kind of ramble into my phone. And it was more like a podcast. And uh, Actually, I know there's a lot of people who maybe aren't comfortable on camera or who are, are too shy to go on camera or whatever else. And, and there's nothing wrong with doing a podcast or, or kind of creating your YouTube videos like more of a podcast format. I think technically speaking, YouTube requires that there's a video, but I mean, there's plenty of people who put a still image in the background or worst case scenario, you could do a, uh, uh, what's the word I'm looking for? Like a slideshow or something like that. So I mean, if you're not comfortable on camera, you can still start a YouTube channel and, and do it that way. But that's what I do. I used to on my way home from work and to work, I, you know, kind of hold my camera and, or my phone in a car and just kind of ramble about topics. And it was really, really poor quality stuff. I'd basically go on like the Yahoo homepage, see what was trending, oh, the story about Kim Kardashian. And I would just kind of like recap and ramble a story that I heard. Or sometimes I'd, I'd go on like Drudge Report and get like clickbaity type articles and, and basically just either read them or kind of recap them. And, and it's, that kind of first kind of piqued my interest in YouTube. Um, I think then I started just doing reviews of like, I went to the dollar store and picked up a, a can of tuna cracker things for lunch and made a video review of that and was like kind of shocked that it got like thousands of views. And, and like one of my earliest videos that got a ton of reviews was actually a review of uh, Instant Nest Cafe, Nest Cafe Coffee, which is what I'm actually drinking right now. Um, but it's really crazy the type of like random stuff that will get views. Um, and then somehow that kind of morphed into, uh, you know, I'd been doing kind of e-commerce and had a landscaping business and did some other stuff. Uh, but that's when I kind of started, uh, you can't do it. Uh, that's kind of when I started uh, doing like tutorials about how to use T Terapeak and like what I'm selling on eBay and Amazon. And I was doing some videos about like service businesses when I had my landscaping company. And then it just kind of turned into this YouTube channel. And 
I really don't think of myself as a YouTuber. I'm actually very shy. I'm actually very introverted. Uh, very few people know that I have a YouTube channel. Uh, I remember for like years, I hid it from my girlfriend and uh, she'd like look over my shoulder, would be laying in bed and I'd be messing around on the computer. And uh, she'd, what are you doing? And I'd close it shut and she's like, what, what the hell are you on? Like, you know, okay Cupid or something behind my back. And, and finally, I think she was getting really suspicious and I had to show her that I did YouTube. And she used to kind of make fun of me for a while. You know, she she knew I was kind of embarrassed about it or shy about it. So she'd poke fun at me. And, uh, you know, if I started making a video, she'd come around the corner and, hi, I'm, I'm Rules for Rubble. You know, and, and she used to like to goof with me. And actually, my, my business partner knows I have a YouTube channel. It was actually his son stumbled upon it and was like, oh, there's Johnny on YouTube. And um, yeah, for whatever reason, I'm almost kind of like, in, I don't know if embarrassed is the right word, but it's just kind of awkward when people you know in real life see you on uh on youtube who isn't on okay cupid um so yeah it's kind of funny when people in real life see you on youtube and i, I actually got recognized in public for the first time uh a few months back and I, that was kind of uh at first kind of weird but it was also kind of funny uh i was at the gym and i, I was working out in this machine and uh this kid comes up to me and he kind of signaled me to take my headphones off and i thought he was going to tell me i was using the equipment weird are you done with this machine and he was like, this is going to sound really weird, but do you have a YouTube channel? And obviously, like, I got the ponytail and stuff. I'm a little bit easy to pick out. Uh, but we chatted for a minute, talked about, you know, entrepreneurship and some of this other stuff. And ever since we actually meet up, uh, you know, maybe once a month, we go get sushi and kind of talk business and uh, and all that type of stuff. So I actually have a video I shot with him about a month ago that I've been meaning to post. Um, and he's in a program called Praxis, which is kind of like a, an entrepreneurship boot camp sort of trade school thing, kind of an alternative to college. I still haven't posted the video. It's, it's kind of funny in the video. He was really worried about going on camera and being awkward. And I'm actually the one who's super awkward. And I've never done an in-person video before, or an in-person interview. And even live streams I've done, I'm always kind of a little bit awkward. But like when we were doing it person to face to face, I'm like, do I look at him? Do I look at the camera? How do I sit? I was sitting in kind of an awkward position on the couch. So, uh, I, oh, and then my, my girlfriend walked in in the middle and interrupted it. So I have to edit that. So I will get that posted, uh, posted soon here. I'm going to look like a total weirdo in it, but I think there's some good value in it as well. So I'll post that for you guys here soon. Um, totally lost my train of thought and where we were going with that. But, uh, oh yeah. So he was, uh, the first person I, I, I met in real life through YouTube. And lately I've been going to some Bitcoin meetups. I've been meaning to go to like some Toastmasters groups and some local entrepreneurship meetups. And on YouTube, for a lot of terms about like Amazon merch, uh, drop shipping, affiliate marketing, cryptocurrency stuff, like I'm one of the first results to pop up. So it's uh, I'm always kind of wondering, like when I go to one of these things, like if somebody's new to Bitcoin and is searching Bitcoin, there's there's a good chance they're going to pop up on, on some of my videos. But anyhow, that's kind of how I got my early start on YouTube. Uh, one of my goals in 2018 was to kind of take it more seriously. It, it's kind of weird, you know. YouTube was always more of a hobby and wanting to connect with people and wanting to help people. And I never really viewed it as like a business thing or really created it as professional as I probably should have. So probably could have gotten more like sponsorship deals and done more of that type of stuff. And not even necessarily all that type of stuff, but even just having like a channel description and a channel preview and all these things that like every YouTuber should have. And I kind of slack on some of that stuff, which is kind of funny because on a lot of my other like channels for business and affiliate marketing and things, I do everything by the book, but because this is more of a hobby, I kind of haven't taken it as seriously. So this is, you know, putting kind of more effort towards production value, uh, towards making the channel a little bit more professional, things like that is is some of the things I want to do in the new year here. But yeah, just wanted to kind of start off kind of recapping my journey a little bit. Um, let's see. Uh, in terms of how this gives some, oh, I think we already touched on how this gives some smaller YouTubers an advantage. Uh, watch time's important, uploading other people's content. Um, better experience um yeah one of the things you know okay so i think during one of my litecoin giveaways back in 2017 uh one of the questions that i asked you guys one week was uh what's like some of your goals for 2018 or things you want to do for 2018 and a lot of you guys had said you wanted to start youtube channels or blogs and i don't know how many of you guys have actually followed through on that but uh you know I'm just as guilty as you guys of like wanting to take on these projects and maybe you're overwhelmed with stuff. Maybe you put it off for whatever reason you don't get started. Um, but another reason I think a lot of people don't get started is you're worried about you're going to suck early on. And it, it kind of makes me think of a Grant Cardone uh, quote, which is kind of one of my favorite quotes. And he says, you can't get to quality without doing quantity first. 
Um, and, and I think that's very, very true. And it, by no means is that saying like put out subpar work, but no matter what you start doing, when you first start doing something, you're going to suck at it. Um, and you're going to have to get through that period to get good at it. It's like riding a bike. You know, if the first time you got on a bike and fell off, you're like, well, I'm not going to do this because I'm not good at it. But if you don't suck at it for a while, you're never going to get good and you're never going to learn how to ride the bike. So make your content. If it sucks, so what? One thing that can actually make you feel good is early on, nobody's watching you anyway. So nobody's even going to see, you know, the blunders that you make and things like that. Uh, let me check in on the comments here real quick. Um, running four webcams and it's amazing stuff people choose to subside to. Um, yeah, I'm not really sure what you mean, Ted Belcher. Um, let's see here. Uh, yeah, so get past the period of, of sucking. And I'm, I'm still guilty of that today. You know, I would say for every video I, I actually post, I probably make five more videos that I'm like, oh, my hair looks stupid in that video. Oh, I misspoke there. Oh, I'm not really happy with this that I don't even post. And, and I think at the end of the day, the content you put, when you make content, you never know if people are going to like it or dislike it. And a lot of the content that I'm really proud of or that I think is great, you know, it doesn't get the views, doesn't get the likes. And a lot of times something that I may think sucks actually winds up being very, very well received by people. So um, I think you're much less likely to lose somebody over a crappy video than you are to pick up a bunch of sub subscribers over a video that you don't post because you think it's not good enough. Um, and that's something that I got to kind of get past as well. Uh, another kind of weird thing that I do, I, I'm, I hate editing videos. I'm horrible at it. Um, and it is something that I need to put more effort towards and get better at, but like, I'm kind of uh, one shot, right? So I might ramble for 30 minutes. And if in the last minute of a video, I make a mistake, I'll just scratch the whole thing and start over. Whereas really I could just edit that piece out. So that, that winds up being why a lot of content uh, doesn't get posted as well. Um, running people, okay, got different webcams running. Uh, WK Dravina was talking about having multiple webcams running. If, if I'm not mistaken, just kind of a, a totally off topic, but kind of funny thing. The uh, heavy set guy from Howard Stern, I forget his name, but I think he has either a YouTube channel or maybe he live streams on Twitch, but it's literally him in his little studio apartment all day long, sitting around in his underwear doing absolutely nothing but like eating cereal and, and you know, watching TV and like literally tens, if not hundreds of thousands of people, uh, you know, watch it. So, I mean, I, I think you could literally, if you're live streaming, you can literally get people to watch almost anything. Uh, Artie Lang, that's who it is. Thank you, Jay Capola. Um, another guy, for a while I was watching uh, Pharma Bro, uh, Martin Trichelli. And uh, if you ever tune into his live streams, they're really weird. I mean, sometimes he'll talk about stuff, but other times for like literally three hours, it'll just be kind of him sitting. He's got a guitar in the corner. And he's just kind of sitting here. He may not even talk. He may just sit here and pet his cat for an hour and a half. And, you know, I'm as guilty as everybody else. I'll sit there and watch it. I don't know why. Um, but yeah, I mean, you could literally live stream anything and make money or not make money, but live stream anything and people will watch. Um, you can literally live stream, live stream garbage and people will watch it. I remember when uh, Periscope was kind of big and I was putting an effort towards that. Everybody would Periscope their wake and bake sessions and there would literally be tens of thousands of people watching it. So if you actually do something interesting, you know, maybe you're working on a car, uh, maybe you're doing a DIY project at your house, whatever it may be, people will watch that. And because you can engage with people on live streams, um, and you know, here I'm talking about live streams like I'm some expert on them. I'm scared to death of them, but um, logically, I, I know that they work and, and, and why they work. But uh, you can rack up a ton of watch time on live streams because people are engaged and will stay on. And then also, once that video posts, uh, people can watch it after the fact as well. Uh, let's see, where else were we going? Um, in terms of like who you're catering your content, yeah, I'm kind of all over the place here, so please excuse me for that. But uh, in terms of like the type of audience you're going after, one thing that this new policy is going to force you to do, in the past, there were a lot of people who had channels maybe about everything, right? So maybe today I'm doing a review of coffee, and tomorrow I'm talking about cryptocurrency, and Wednesday I'm live streaming myself at Six Flags. That type of content may be interesting, but as far as getting subscribers, which let's keep in mind, we need to get 100,000 subscribers. When it comes to getting subscribers, a lot of people are only going to subscribe to content that they want to see on a regular basis. So if somebody watches a cryptocurrency video of mine that they absolutely love, but five days out of the week, I'm doing videos doing like food reviews, they're probably not going to subscribe to me. And I actually have another YouTube channel where I just do completely random content. It's almost kind of a testing ground. Uh, to try out different niches, see what people are interested in, 
see what gets views, et cetera. That type of channel, I get a lot of views and things like that, but a lot of people aren't going to subscribe because it's completely random stuff. It could be current events, a news story, a food review, a how-to video. Um, so I think one thing about YouTube moving forward is you're going to need to settle in on a niche because you're going to need to get those subscribers. Now, I'm not sure if other people would endorse this strategy or not. Um, I think it's just kind of a natural evolution that a lot of YouTubers go through. But something I might suggest you do early on is make all types of random videos, right? Like see what works, see what doesn't work, see what gets views, see what doesn't get, get views. And you will pull in some random views and subscribers, even if you're doing completely random stuff. Um, and then once you do that for a while and, and kind of get your feet wet a little bit, then focus down on a niche and, uh, you know, then kind of, kind of go hard on a niche. And I think that can be an effective strategy. And I think also just kind of naturally, a lot of people don't necessarily know what they want to make videos about. Um, another thing you're going to want to do is pick a topic that you're actually interested in and passionate about. And that leaves a lot of room to make a lot of different types of content because, I, I don't know, I'm having a hard time thinking of an example, but there's certain niches, certain topics you can make where like literally you make 10 or 12 videos and you've pretty much covered everything there is to cover. So in terms of like entrepreneurship and things like that, like I've done tutorials about pretty much everything that I could possibly do tutorials on and opposed to just kind of continually rehashing things. Um, something that I could go in a different direction of is like more Q and A type stuff. I could do current events, changes to these different platforms. But make sure you're choosing a niche that A, you're going to be interested in for the long term, and B, something that lends itself to being able to kind of evolve over time. Um, again, in terms of types of content, we have what's called evergreen content, and then there's, there's more kind of like trending stuff. Um, I guess an example of evergreen content might be how to tie a tie, how to fix a leaky sink. Like those things aren't going to change. You fixed a leaky sink back in 2012 the same way you do in 2018. So that's the type of video that for 10, 15 years, people are going to continue going back to and watching. However, a video like this one about YouTube monetization policy in 2018, it's probably not a video that somebody's going to watch in 2020. So you're going to want to do a nice mix of evergreen content as well as more trending content. Uh, another thing you can start doing is culture hacking, right? And so culture hacking is kind of, I guess you could just basically cover trends, but culture hacking is the idea of tying what you do in with some cause or some movement. So uh, one example, this is more of an advertising example, but one example that comes to mind is when Pepsi was trying to like, Pepsi, remember when Pepsi was like having people hand out Pepsis during the riots in California and they kind of tied themselves into that. But that's kind of a poor example, but like, let, let's talk about Logan Paul, right? Like anything done about Logan Paul a few weeks ago after that suicide forest video, that type of stuff would get a ton of views. So you could just make a video commenting on it, but from like an entrepreneurship angle or whatever, you could talk about like how to manage your brand reputation. So I could tie that into my entrepreneurship channel, not be totally off topic and still bring in a lot of new viewers and a lot of new views off this kind of trending topic. Uh, let me check in on the comments real quick here. A uh, cool channel called Boiler Room where artists, musicians sit around and smoke out and make music. That actually sounds really cool. Um, there's another YouTube channel I like. Uh, I'm not sure if it's like a small kind of uh, grassroots thing or if it's more of a um, more of like a, a business or something like that. It's called the I'm scrolling through like my watch history right now to see if I can find it. Uh, oh, fistful of is it fistful of vinyl? I think it's called fistful of vinyl or vinyl sessions, but. Um, I'm not sure if it's a radio station or what they are, but they have this awesome big like studio with like record albums all along the wall. And they have different like kind of folk and indie artists come in and do a little interview and then play a couple songs like live ac acoustic. Um, so that's kind of a different way. I think in terms of YouTube, like there's a lot of things you could do. You could go out and interview local business owners. You could have artists come into you. Uh, you could have business owners come in. And these are, you know, here I'm throwing out all these examples of things that I'm not even doing myself. So that, that's been something I've been wanting to do is do more collab hey what's happening boss lady uh do more collaborations with other people do more interviews and things like that and honestly it's kind of it's surprising how hard it is to get people to come on to a channel and do like an interview with you or whatever else um i get that some people are bigger than me and i'm not going to really add any value to them but i mean there's youtubers who have five thousand subscribers uh, or even a couple hundred subscribers who I really like what they do. And I reach out to them and I'm like, hey, I, I think you're awesome. I, you know, I don't know how you're not past me and subscribers and things like that. 
I'd love to have you on the channel. And well, that would be a great opportunity to for them to expose themselves to you guys, my audience, which is much larger and grow their following. And you just never hear back from people. And I'm guilty of it as well, right? Like I don't always do all the collaborations that I probably have at my disposal. Um, that kind of brings up another interesting point, which is uh, I'm definitely looking to do more collaborations, more interviews, more things like that. I know Jay Capola, who's in the room right now, uh, he's reached out to me a number of times wanting to do something. I End of the year was just kind of crazy for me. I've definitely been meaning to get back to Jay Capola. Uh, but yeah, if any of you guys have YouTube channels that you're just starting out, if you'd have any interest in having me on your channel, uh, I'd love to come on your guys' channels and, and kind of chat and talk about some stuff. And I'd be happy to kind of plug it through my social avenues and things like that as well, which can kind of, kind of help you. And it also kind of helps me get more exposure as well. So all of you guys who got channels, got whatever else, feel free to reach out to me at rulesforrebels at gmail.com. And then likewise, I would love to have you guys um, on the channel as well. Um, you know, if, if you have a business or if you have something interesting going on or are knowledgeable about some subject matter, obviously I don't know everything about everything. You know, let me close the door here. My girlfriend just got home. I'm going to be in trouble here for not having dinner ready. Um, but yeah, obviously, you know, there's certain areas that, that I'm strong in, but there's other things like Facebook ads or building websites and things like that, that I'm not very strong at that. I know a lot of people who watch this channel would like to know about. So if you have a skill to share anything like that, I would love to have you on and I would be more than happy to, to kind of plug you in your stuff as well. Um, it's all good. Love the collab. You know what, boss lady? I, I'd love to collab with you as well. Hit, hit me up. Uh, I know we, we kind of talk on here a little bit and on steam it as well, but yeah, hit me up rules for rebels at gmail.com. And, uh, I'll reach out to, uh, I'll try to reach out to you as well. I think I can probably find your, your email on your channel or something like that. Um, I think we're talking about audiences. So, uh, audiences, young versus old audiences. So, um, younger audiences obviously are going to watch a lot more YouTube, right? Like middle school, high school, grade school kids, they get off the bus, they come home from school and they literally sit and stare at their smartphone until about 10 o'clock at night. And we know that from like YouTube analytics stuff, right? People who are 25 to 34 or even older than that, people have jobs, people are starting businesses. You know, I watch a lot of YouTube, but I don't have that much time to watch YouTube. So when you're catering to a younger audience, like, yeah, you're going to get a ton of watch time and a ton of views, but keep in mind, young people, they don't have money to spend. Um, and also, so they don't have money to spend to buy things from you, but furthermore, advertisers know they don't have money to spend either. So advertisers are not as keen to advertise on those types of channels. Um, one example that comes to mind, I forget the girl's name, but there was a story of a girl, I've talked about this before, but there's a story of a girl who's like internet famous, right? She's got like two, three million YouTube subscribers and she she waits at a, she's a waitress at a restaurant because she can't pay the bills despite, you know, being internet famous. I think she's had cameos in movies, um, but she's getting a very, very low CPM. CPM is basically how much you're being paid per thousand views. Um, and if you're in something like, making money, entrepreneurship, uh, fitness, health, that type of things, very high CPMs, right? People pay a lot of money for those kind of like evergreen, what do they say? Health, wealth, uh, relationships and love. I don't know. There, there, there's a handful of things that people will pay big money for. And that's why you see a lot of courses and products geared towards that. Um, and if you have a channel about that, your CPM can be 15, 20. I know there's some YouTubers who claim their CPMs are even 30, $40, but like, You'll hear a lot of people say, on average, the average CPM is about a dollar. Um, and that, that's probably true. Like if you're doing a prank channel, if you're eating cinnamon or wasabi, doing wasabi challenges, like that's not really geared towards an advertiser. So, well, those channels will get a ton of views. Advertisers may be like, okay, a million people watch this video. I'll advertise on there to get in front of people, but I'm not really willing to spend a ton of money to get my ad up there because that content isn't really specifically geared towards like any one thing. Um, but when you have a channel focused on like entrepreneurship, people like Oberlo or Jungle Scout or TubeBuddy, like those types of companies are going to want to advertise on my channel because those are products and services that people like myself and you guys are actually using to run your businesses and things like that. If you have a channel about fitness, supplement companies, companies who sell workout equipment, 
fitness programs, personal trainers, like all those people want to advertise on your channel. If you have a DIY channel, you know, people who Home Depot, companies like that want to advertise. So um, a lot of times the stuff that gets the mega views isn't necessarily going to make the money. But getting back to that story, someone came up to this girl and was like, oh, are you, are you a waitressing here? Is this like part of some gig for YouTube? And she's like, no, I work here. Um, and again, she, you know, despite having millions of viewers, uh, subscribers, being YouTube famous, uh, she's not making enough money to support herself. And then you're going to have people out there who have like 5,000 subscribers who are able to make a pretty healthy full-time income off of it. Um, and I think Gary V is another example, right? Like I think Gary V has, I think a million subscribers. But if you actually look at the view counts on his videos, it's actually very low. Like maybe, I don't, I don't even know if it's as much as 30%, maybe like 5% of his subscribers actually watch every video. And I think we shouldn't expect everybody to watch every video of ours, right? Like some of my videos about like merch, you guys may watch, you guys may tune in for it. And maybe you're not into crypto or maybe some of you guys come here for a crypto video, but you're not really interested in hearing about like Amazon FBA or whatever else. So um, I'll be yeah, but getting back to, to Gary V, like Gary V's audience is probably 24 to 34. These are like motivated people who are out starting businesses. So they probably don't have 12 hours a day to, uh, to watch YouTube. But then again, Gary can pitch courses and books and advertisers want to come to the channel. So even though he may not be getting the views or the watch time as some of these channels catering to younger people, he's still making good money. Uh, let's see things like fitness, hot trend, very sad. Okay. So if you're thinking about what to start your channel based on, you know, things like fitness are, are really hot, really popular but it's also a very, very competitive space. Um, so what you could do is something like, okay, I'm gonna gear my fitness channel towards busy young professionals who don't have a lot of time to go to the gym. And here's like a 15 minute workout you can do every day to get in great shape, um, but you know, without having to spend two hours in the gym. Or I'm gonna make a makeup channel, but as opposed to catering to like 16 year old girls, my makeup channel is gonna be catered to women over 40 and how to hide blemishes on your face or something like that. So. Sometimes when you go ultra small on your niche, like, yeah, you're never going to be a subscriber with a million views, but the people who come to your channel are really dedicated and really loyal to you and really like your, your message. So that could be something else you go for. Uh, I think we talked about teens watch the most YouTube, uh, chasing trends and evergreen niches. Um, in terms of the type of content that you make, so some of your content is going to be geared towards your regular subscribers. And other content is going to be geared towards trying to like bring in new subscribers and grow your audience. Um, alternatives to YouTube ads. So um, in the early days of starting your YouTube channel, at this point in time, you can't even get monetized. But even if you were monetized, you wouldn't be making that much money. And I saw even before this new bar was set in terms of YouTube monetization, even at 10,000 views, people like, oh, my gosh. I'm losing out on all this money until I get to 10,000 views. And with a dollar CPM, 10,000 views, you're losing out on about $10. I mean, if you're going to quit YouTube or not get started on YouTube over missing out on 10 bucks, you probably wouldn't have gotten too far with YouTube anyways. Um, don't tell me about your job, side hustle, what you do. Uh, you know, Boss Lady just brought up an interesting point. I don't mean to get too off track. I'm going to try to wrap this up uh, a little bit quickly. I didn't make dinner, so I'm going to have to go grab some Chipotle for me and my girlfriend in a little bit here. I purposely skipped the gym because I've been kind of slacking on YouTube a little bit lately. Um, oh, yeah, but uh, Boss Lady was talking about kind of documenting your hustle, and that's what Gary Vee says. Don't document, don't create. So when you try to create, it, it's really tough. It takes a lot of time, but if you're just documenting what you're doing, you know, I'm starting a drop shipping business and here's what I did today to get started. And that's something that I've been meaning to do a little bit more lately, um, but that's a great way to launch a channel. Uh, I think a lot of people think like, oh, I'm not an expert at this, so I can't make this video. And I, I fall into that myself as well. So sometimes I'll be like, I'll make a video and I'll be like, oh, you know, I, I don't really know about this one area of that that I tell, oh, you know, battery's running low here. Let me get a... Uh... Okay, I think we were talking about what documenting and not creating. So uh, actually, I totally lost myself here. Um, oh yeah. So sometimes I'll want to make content on something that I think is really interesting. Like just for example, today, uh, Bittrex announced in a podcast I think last night or within the past couple of days 
that they're going to be adding fiat to their cryptocurrency exchange. Now, I know some of you guys may not be in a crypto and you may be like, what the hell are you talking about? But that's a big deal for anybody in the crypto space, but there's very little information about it online. So it's like, how do I make a video about like, hey guys, uh, I heard Bittrex is going to be announcing, uh, are going to be adding fiat currencies to their exchange, but I don't really know much more about it to post a video. I, I would wind up just not making the video. That's kind of a poor example, but I might not make, not wind up making that video. Or maybe I want to make a video about like, I don't know, Amazon FBA, but there's one area of it that will I do it and stumble through? I'm not an expert on it. And you almost have imposter syndrome. And I'm like, oh, well, if I don't know everything about this better than everybody out there, I can't make this video. And really, if you just kind of document what you're doing, most people kind of respect that and appreciate that and are understandable that you, you know, maybe make a mistake in what you say or that you don't cover every little inch of that subject matter. So I think the whole document not create thing is pretty good. Uh, I'm going to start kind of blowing through this stuff and then we'll kind of maybe open it up to a Q&A or if you guys want to make some points, we can kind of talk about some of that stuff. Uh, but yeah, alternatives to uh, to monetizing YouTube, affiliate marketing is a great one. Um, you can sell courses, you can sell coaching. That stuff may come later, right? You almost kind of need to establish yourself as an expert before you start uh, making people pay to talk to you or, or buy your course or whatever else. But that's something that can come down the road. Uh, I'm a big fan of Steemit. Uh, it's me, Boss Lady is on Steemit. Uh, Mitchy Boy's on Steemit. Uh, Vogeltron, I don't know if he's in here. I know a lot of you guys are on Steemit. And I, I know Ste a lot of people are like, oh, you know, I tried Steemit. It, it just, it didn't seem like I was getting anywhere. But if you're making content already, whether it be a blog or a YouTube channel, there's no reason not to have a Steemit account and post your content there because it's going to take you 10 seconds to repost it there. And you are guaranteed to make some money on Steemit. Everybody can be monetized on Steemit. And if you, what's up, ABTV? If, if you stay, if you stick with it and you're on Steemit for a while, as your YouTube business, for lack of a better word, grows, your Steemit's going to grow as well. And once you do start making that YouTube money, you're also going to have the Steemit stuff going as well. Another thing, when you post your video on Steemit, you're exposing another audience to your content and they may follow you over to uh, to YouTube. It's kind of funny. Uh, I had Reseller, who is a thrift shop hustler. He may be in here. Um I actually discovered Thrift Shop Hustler on Steemit under his handle Reseller. I'd never found him on YouTube before. He makes great content. If uh, if you guys haven't checked him out, check him out. Thrift Shop Hustler on YouTube. He kind of uh, makes videos about like what he's selling on eBay. He also does Amazon merch. He does Steemit. He does live streams almost every day. He's kind of an inspiration to me in terms of uh, kind of being more active on YouTube and kind of how he's running his channel. And I think he's probably going to, unless I step up my game, he's going to kind of surpass me on YouTube here. Um, but I would have never discovered him if he weren't on Steemit. So kind of the more channels you can be on, the better. A while back, I tried something called VidMe. That kind of totally sucked. But nonetheless, I was going to go over there one of these days and just do a video dump and like dump my 800 whatever videos on there and maybe get exposure to a different audience. Um, another thing, uh, one thing I see a lot of people starting out on youtube talking about it or focusing on is like camera gear i see people on reddit and forums and the youtube subreddit like okay guys i'm starting a youtube channel do i buy this you know i don't even know a camera off the top of my head do i buy this sony xv7 camera for two thousand dollars or do i buy the xb5 for six thousand dollars and it's like you haven't even started the youtube channel yet and you're buying camera gear that people who are making indie films are buying and it's uh it's completely unnecessary uh let me grab something real quick here so i actually uh and, and not that I'm, I'm proud of having kind of poor quality content but uh pretty much the entire history of my youtube channel growing to seventy thousand subscribers i've used a cell phone it started out with a htc evo um then i had some samsung's now i mean it's just an lg v20 Pretty much all my videos I make with a cell phone camera. A lot of times I even use a front-facing camera, uh, which is even poorer quality. And I've managed to grow it this big doing that. And that's not to say that I shouldn't step up my content. Uh, but the point is you don't need all this fancy equipment that shouldn't stop you from getting started. There's a YouTuber. Maybe somebody can drop his name in the comments. His name is Shane something. And he has 600,000 subscribers. He makes his videos and edits his videos with a cell phone. So... You don't need all this fancy equipment. This is a, a Canon SL2. I bought this right around Christmas time. I still have not even used it yet. 
um, was meaning to get more into photography and wanted to kind of up the uh, quality in here, but I got to, I got to learn to use this thing. Also, I got to figure out how to set this up so that I can actually like connect it to my computer and live stream with it and everything else. But I mean, I'm, I don't even know how long I've been doing YouTube for, but I mean, I'm five to six years in 70,000 subscribers in before I really spend any money on a decent camera. So, um, you know, as you grow, if you want to buy cameras and things like that, more power to you. Great. The better your production value is awesome, but make sure you're going to stick with YouTube for a while. Don't feel like you have to have all this great equipment and don't let that stop you from getting started. Um, another thing I use sometimes is, I don't even know where it's at, but I got a, uh, an LG V20, or I'm sorry, an LG V20, uh, a C920 Logitech uh, webcam. Uh, that comes in handy. I mean, most of my stuff is, is made with, I got a cell phone mount on the window of my car that I do a lot of car videos with. I got one of these little $10 uh, tripods to hold my phone. And again, only more recently have I actually started buying any equipment. Got a little, I don't know, Amazon Basics tripod. Um, and I picked this up used. Uh, this is a blue Nessie. A lot of people are using the, the blue crack dice or whatever it's called. Um, but yeah, you really don't need a, a ton of equipment to make halfway decent videos and especially not, to, uh, not for just getting started. Um, so people can find live streams even if they're not sub to you. Yeah, Mitchie boy. So live streams actually, you know, here I, again, I am talking about how great live streams are, and I've done like five of them in my life. But uh, live streams actually rank really, really well. I think it's a great way to get discovered by by new audiences. Uh, live streams typically come up at the top of YouTube searches. Um, I actually did something kind of goofy a while back just to kind of experiment with this. So a lot of times in like the cryptocurrency space, <coughs> I see people. Uh, basically all they have they're just live streaming a chart uh like the gdax chart or when bitcoin futures opened up people just put the futures uh charts on a screen and literally live stream no talking in the background no nothing just looking at a chart and there would be thousands of people in their room and it, and the chat box on the right would literally turn into almost like a message board and even though there's nothing but a uh bitcoin futures chart on the screen and anybody could just go into the website and watch it themselves. Everybody is on this YouTube video, this YouTube live stream watching it, and they're chatting about what do you think the futures are going to do to this? And this guy made a fortune. He was probably watching TV, smoking a bowl in the other room, and people are chatting on his channel, giving him all this watch time. Uh, just a couple interesting twists on this. This is maybe a little bit more along the lines of, I don't even know if I want to say gaming the system, but like, if you live in a cool area, like one of my uh, girlfriend's cousins used to live in the loop downtown Chicago, right out her window was Navy Pier. Um, you could probably set your set a camera up live streaming, looking out the window and people would just kind of watch it to see what's going on on the streets of Chicago. So there's a lot of like little kind of like hack stuff like that you can do. I remember at one point I live streamed uh, a little Dicky concert uh, that wound up getting a lot of views. Uh, let's see, we talked about equipment. Uh, one of the biggest things you need to do to succeed on YouTube, titles, tags, and descriptions. Uh, again, you know, I'm far from one of the best YouTubers out there, a long, long ways to go. Production value, I kind of suck. I feel like I have a good content. I'm not necessarily the most well-spoken or I kind of ramble. I'm, you know, kind of all over the place. Um, I think people, you know, there are positive things about my channel, but one of the things that I think really saves me is titles, tags, and descriptions. If you're not doing titles, tags, and descriptions, YouTube isn't even going to show your videos to allow people to find you. Um, and even a lot of the bigger YouTubers that I see, like I, I use a, a program called TubeBuddy. Um, and what TubeBuddy does, it allows you to see like all the metadata on everybody's video. So if I'm watching like Superman's video or his live stream about cryptocurrency, I can see what tags he put in. And like a lot of really big, really popular YouTubers are pretty much riding on their YouTube fame and their popularity and their subscribers. Because if you actually look at their metadata, like no, they have very crappy uh, keywords and everything like that. Nobody's going to find it. So as a new, as a newer YouTuber, if you don't have a huge following, you really need to take care of that metadata. So put in a title, your description. <coughs> excuse me, your description should be basically like a mini blog post. And that's something that I do because pretty much all my content, I repost to Steemit. So even though I embed the video into Steemit, I also kind of write a mini blog post for YouTube and then that also goes on Steemit. And I know sometimes like people may be at work, they may not be able to watch a video. 
but on Steam it, they can at least read kind of a summary of, of what that content's about. Uh, but yeah, I mean, absolutely most important new thing you can do as, I mean, when we talk about how to succeed on YouTube with a new monetization policy and in 2018, it really comes down to a handful of things. It's not rocket science. It's not really anything new. The same things that worked three years ago are going to work today. And it's titles, tags, and descriptions, absolutely most important thing. Create content on a regular basis. Regular basis, I would say at the very least, maybe once per week. Ideally, you probably want to be posting two to three times per week. But if you're consistent, you make halfway decent content and you do uh, titles, tags, and descriptions, you will get far on YouTube. Uh, YouTube is a long-term game, right? Like a lot of people say that at least your first year on YouTube, you're not going to be very successful. Some people even say three to five years. Uh, this, like I said, this channel kind of started out as a hobby and it, it slowly grew. And I think the only reason I've made it this far is because I was never like reliant on the income. I was never like, on the early days, I was never about like, I have to get that silver play button. I have to get that many subscribers. It was just something I was doing. And before I knew it, I was at 5,000 subscribers and I was at 10,000. And my channel actually had like, it was, it took a long time to get to that 5,000, but like my growth from 5,000 to 25,000 super fast from 25,000 to like 40 something thousand super fast. I really kind of stalled from 40 to 50 and then 50 to 71, 73, 74, whatever we're at right now has been a very, very long haul. And like I said, I was, you know, I've been doing some kind of self analysis lately or whatever you want to call it. And I realized I'm not the caliber of YouTuber that I need to be to get to 100,000. I don't deserve the silver play button right now. And that's why I'm kind of trying to up my game. I put in a good YouTube description the other day. I'm going to be putting more effort towards my thumbnails. Um, I'm going to be doing more live streams and interacting with you guys more because um, I, I really want to get there. Uh, let's see. Strategy, how I started. Tutorial. Uh, tutorial channels, DIY channels are really good. Um, focus on a specific hobby or a specific skill. One of the fastest YouTube channels that I ever grew, um, and this was kind of a short-term thing, but it was amazingly fast that I got there. So back when hoverboards were really popular, um, I started doing affiliate marketing with hoverboards. My first month on AliExpress, I made over $800. Uh, at that point, I realized that hoverboards were going to be profitable, and I started ordering them wholesale from China and also from some importers who were already bringing them into the USA. Now, in order to do the affiliate marketing early on, I had bought a hoverboard and I wrote it and stuff like that. And hoverboards were like very hot, very trending. Not a lot of people had them. So it was kind of an easy way to get some views. And then because I started selling them, I had to learn about how to work on them because out of a shipment of 50 hoverboards, at one time I had 28 of them that didn't work. So, uh, posting to DTube and Steam it. Oh yeah, I'll touch on DTube and Steam it in a second here. So, um, I, I had to learn how to fix hoverboards myself because hoverboards were new, nobody knew about them. So I kind of taught myself how to fix them. And I used to make videos on how to diagnose problems with hoverboards, how to fix hoverboards, reviewing different hoverboards. And you know, the whole hoverboard craze lasted from maybe what, like October to December, and then it completely died. So in that like three month period, I grew the channel to several thousand subscribers. I had multiple videos with 40,000 plus uh, views on them. Uh, one video, which is like the most common problem with the hoverboard was like calibrating it. That video, I think, had three or 400,000 subscribers. The amount of comments and everything I got was insane. The amount of views was insane. And unfortunately, it was short-lived, but like made a killing off affiliate marketing as well as uh, um, selling hoverboard parts and things like that, all off basically showing people how to fix these things. So if you can solve people's problems, that will get a lot of watch time. That'll get a lot of people coming back. And also kind of a cool thing about hoverboards is if you jump on something new and establish yourself as kind of a, an expert or authority in it early on, you can really get a leg up on everybody else. And in the case of the, hover, the hoverboards, I was one of the first people making these type of videos. So I rose to the top. And from that point, it was hard for anybody to catch me. I know the cryptocurrency space is a little bit saturated right now, but people who even within the past couple months really dedicated themselves to creating content about cryptocurrency, they quickly became an expert. And I mean, look at any cryptocurrency channel. I bet you the vast majority of them haven't been around longer than six months. And almost, I don't want to say all of them because they're small ones, but like there are a ton of people who've gotten 50,000, 100,000, 
several hundred thousand subscribers all in a very short period of time. I don't know exactly how long like Superman's been been around, but Superman has grown really, really quickly. Uh, same with like box mining, um, altcoin buzz, a lot of these other types of channels. Um, it's me, Boss Lady, had mentioned DTube and Steemit. So DTube is basically Steemit's video platform. If I'm not mistaken, maybe Boss Lady can comment on this, but I think there's going to be something called DLive or something like that coming out, which is basically going to be live streaming. Essentially, DTube is like a YouTube clone. Uh, everything you do on DTube posts to Steemit. Um, it, it's kind of like a platform or a, an app that runs on top of Steemit. Another example of this would be something called Steep Shot, which is basically an Instagram clone that also posts to Steam it. Uh, unlike YouTube, which has certain content policies and things like that, you can post anything you want on DTube, and uh, there's nobody to say, oh, well, we don't allow that, or oh, there's nudity in that, we can't post that, or there's drug use in that, we can't. I don't know why I keep going to nudity and drugs. I mean, basically, just any, there's no censorship whatsoever. So that's kind of one cool thing about. DTube. One reason that I don't use DTube that much personally, um, I, I am going to start using it more in the future. I have done a few videos that are like exclusive to DTube. Um, I think uh, it was reseller on Steemit, who's also the thrift shop hustler. He's actually the one that, that clued me into the fact that when you post to DTube, DTube takes 25% of your reward. So whatever you earn, DTube is taking 25% of it for having posted on there. So alternatively, if I make a YouTube video, embed my YouTube video on Steemit, I earn one. I, I don't earn 100% of the rewards because I believe the the curators, the people commenting and upvoting, they also get 25%. But of everything that's my portion, I keep 100% of it. I don't have DTube taking 25%. Also, the views that I get from Steemit count towards my YouTube stats. Whereas if I posted something on DTube, it wouldn't count towards YouTube stats. YouTube watch time and also I'm hoping to bring some people to steam it over to my YouTube channel uh, See DIY mixing evergreen content uh, First year on YouTube is gonna be the toughest um, Oh for any of you guys who are like entertainers, maybe you play an instrument you do a comedy act um, You make goofy skits you can do that stuff live and almost be like a live stand-up com comedian and you can make your money through super chats a super chat is when you're live streaming, somebody can give you money. Um, a, a lot of times I like to promote NavCoin. It's one of my favorite coins. So whenever I'm on like a cryptocurrency live chat, a lot of times I'll give money and be like, hey, can you talk about uh, NavCoin or what do you think about this? And normally most creators will, you know, even if somebody doesn't address every comment, they'll normally always address Super Chat. So it's a way to kind of get somebody's attention. Um, but if you do some type of entertainment, people can support you uh, through Super Chats. So, uh, live streaming and super chatting can be very, very profitable. Um, Supo Man, I bet you makes $100 to $150 per live stream just off super chats. And just to kind of talk about not you guys, but other YouTubers, not my audience. My audience is cool, but the amount of stupid people on YouTube amazes me. So, right after Crypto Nick, um, who was kind of the BitConnect um, promoter, uh, brought everybody onto BitConnect, all these people lost their money. And then later that night, he's doing a super chat, and people are giving him $50 left and right. And here's a guy who made probably between $1.4 and $2 million all off the backs of his subscribers. And these people are still giving him money. I don't know where I was going with that, but that yeah, it just blows my mind. Uh, but yeah, super chat, super, oh, super chat. Yeah, so super chat can be a very effective way to, uh, to earn money through live streams. You can also do like Q&As and things like that. And if people want their question answered or want to be bumped over the top, they can do that. Um, a lot of people think longer videos rank better. Um, I, I would agree with that. I think they tend to, uh, longer videos are also going to get you more watch time. So let's say I made a video about, uh, I'm going to show you guys from start to finish how to build a Shopify store. Uh, that may take me an hour, an hour and a half, but somebody who wants to learn how to build a Shopify store is going to watch that entire video. If I get a hundred people who watch that hour long video, I have 100 hours of watch time off one single video just because it's longer and it's something that keeps engagement. Um, and then lastly, uh, in terms of like trying to find your style, trying to find your voice on YouTube, um, yeah, I remember when I first started, I would watch some other YouTubers and I would almost kind of try to copy them. And it's kind of funny. I see the same thing happening in the crypto space. Um, I see there's several, there's like three or four crypto YouTubers 
who, and I think all of us YouTubers start our channel in a similar way, like, hey, what's up, YouTube? But uh, there's a handful of crypto YouTubers who all literally, like, almost word for word start their videos the same way. And they're like, hello, everybody. Thank you for tuning in. I hope you are all doing well wherever you are today or tonight. And there's like a couple guys who all start their thing the same way. But just in terms of trying to find your voice or trying to find your own style, like look to other YouTubers to see like, okay, I'm just getting started with this. How, how the hell do I even do this? But once you kind of get kind of the groundwork, you know, be your own person, have your own style. And this is something that I struggle with as well. Like a lot of times going your own format, you're like, oh, well, what I'm doing isn't like what Alex Becker is doing or what, like what I'm doing isn't like what, yeah, I don't want to say Ty Lopez. I'm not really trying to be a Ty Lopez, but, um, you know, what I'm doing, is it not as good as this person or, or not the same way as this person? And really there can only be one of each person. Like if I try to copy Alex Becker, I'm not going to be as good as, at copying Alex Becker as Alex Becker. So I might as well just do my own thing, do it in my style. And also people tune into him to see me. People people who tune into him, tune into him to see him and his style. They don't want to see me try to try, try to kind of mock it or mim mimic it. So, uh, you know, try to find your own style. Try to be creative in the types of content that you make. And I think that's going to go a lot further. So that's kind of all I, I got for today. Um, I am going to try to start doing these live streams more often. Um, I got to get running in a few minutes here, but I'll kind of take a look through the... Uh, through the chat here, um, maybe address some of this stuff. And also if anybody has any questions, drop them. We'll maybe kind of keep this live and open for either a Q&A or some things that you guys want to talk about for a few minutes. And then I got to go run and grab some Chipotle because I didn't make dinner. My girlfriend's going to be pissed here. Um, let's see. A bunch, bunch of guys killing it using GoPros. Yeah, GoPros, uh, drone videos are really popular. Uh, one kind of cool thing, like even if you're just documenting your hobbies, documenting your life, like one thing that I try to do, not all the time, and lately I've been kind of busy, but basically monetize your life for back, lack of a better word. So sometimes like if I buy something at Costco, maybe I buy a new, I don't know, pre-made dinner or whatever else, what the heck, make a video review of it, right? You will be surprised how many people watch that type of stuff. If you wanted to drop some affiliate links, like Costco is a bad example because they don't have an affiliate program, but like, you know, if I buy this uh, tripod, even if it's not on my main channel, on another channel, why not make a little two-minute review? doesn't have to be anything super professional. Hey, guys, I got this uh, Amazon Basics tripod. It's pretty cool. It's not the sturdiest, but, uh, blah, you know, something like that. Not only can you make money off the YouTube ads on that video, but also I could drop an affiliate link to it. I know almost any time I try to buy a product that's, like, more expensive, I normally go to YouTube and either see what somebody's opinion is or a lot of times I'd like to actually, you know, I can see this on Amazon site, but I don't really know, like, how does this thing go up and down? How does it tilt? And so in a video, you're able to show something off a little bit more. So great opportunity to make money, uh, not only off, like, the watch time, but also the uh, potential affiliate programs. In terms of, like, documenting things that you're doing, a lot of people ask about this. So I'm in Chicago, but I have a surfboard. Like, what the hell is that about? So, um Basically, I, I discover it. I've always liked the water. I love going to the beach and things like that. I don't necessarily live in the best climate for it. Um, but I've seen that there's a bit, not a big community, but there's a small little, very active community of freshwater surfers on Lake Michigan. A lot of you guys may or may not know that you can actually surf on the Great Lakes. Unfortunately, it's all it's only during like super stormy weather. Um So anyhow, I decided that I'm going to get into uh, Great Lakes surfing this winter. So I went and bought myself a 7 millimeter wetsuit, got a surfboard. Uh, haven't made it out there yet. We haven't really had any uh, stormy weather. I've been keeping an eye on like the surf report and stuff. We don't get a ton of opportunities to go out, so you got to be ready when you do. Um, I, know apps, I know very little about surfing aside from trying it a few times on vacation. I'm not really part of the Great Lakes surfing community, but I think people might think that's interesting. So once I actually get out there... If I make a video showing it, people might think it's cool. And then somebody might be like, well, how do you, how the hell do you stay warm when it's like, you know, five degrees and you're out there in the water that's 15 degrees or 30 degrees or whatever it is. Oh, well, I got this seven millimeter wetsuit and you could kind of document, basically, even though I don't know that much about surfing and especially freshwater surfing, I could document my experience of learning about it. Like, oh, I bought this wetsuit. It's not warm enough. I'm freezing. So uh, yeah, definitely document your life, document what you're doing. Uh, let's see. Lifestyle marketing. Uh, yeah. Jay Coppola hit it there. So 
Um, a lot of people talk about like lifestyle businesses. Um, look at all these like YouTube travelers and things like that. They basically want to live a life traveling, being digital nomads or whatever. And they essentially just document their life. And that's how they kind of support their lifestyle and thing like and things like that. Uh, what about partnering with other channels? Yeah, I think partnering with other channels can be very, very effective. Um, it's actually something I need to be doing a lot more of. Uh, Reezy Resells uh, has hit me up a number of times wanting me to collaborate. And I mentioned this earlier. Um, sometimes I'm a little bit intimidated uh, collaborating with other YouTubers. I'm a little bit kind of weird or socially awkward. So like, I'm always fearful that like we're going to run out of things to talk about and how do I end the conversation? And um, I don't know, I'm, I'm just kind of weird like that. But uh, something I've been meaning to do a lot more of, but Reezy Resells has a huge audience who's interested in the same things that my audience is interested in. So if I go on his channel, I'm potentially exposed to thousands of people who don't know about me Alternatively, if he comes on my channel, some of you guys have probably heard about him. Other people may not have. Uh, but if he comes on my channel, then you guys hear about him and maybe you go subscribe to him. And it's just kind of fresh content, right? Like you guys always hear my perspective and my views. So it's kind of cool to hear me and, and kind of an opposing view or somebody else who can offer a different perspective. What stopped you from starting your rolling paper biz? Okay, Munch. So yeah, so... Uh, this is actually an idea that just came about recently. Um, and this would be sort of in a way, a lifestyle business. Um, I, I try to keep this channel somewhat professional, which is why I'm not like smoking spliffs on the channel or whatever. Uh, but at the same time, I'm not going to like hide that part of, of, you know, there's nothing necessarily to be ashamed about. It's just not really going to be a focus of this channel. But I was thinking about starting a rolling paper company, uh, kind of a low barrier to entry business, right? They're very cheap to get started. Really all I have to do is come up with packaging to, to packaging design, find a supplier, come up with a brand. But that's something that like really lends itself to content marketing and lifestyle marketing. Uh, so I am actually still, I, I just came about that idea within the past week or two. I've been in talks with some suppliers. Um, I'm kind of looking around a little bit. The first supplier I talked to wanted me to order about six grand worth of rolling papers. Um, one kind of cool thing about that is I could sell it brick and mortar to like head shops and gas stations and stuff near me as well as trying to create a brand online. Uh, but that's something that would really lend itself to using content marketers, using influencers. Um, you know, there's a lot of guys on Steemit who like medical marijuana or even recreational marijuana is legal in their state. And like every day they're making a video like, oh, I tried purple Bubba Kushmaster douchey, whatever goofy name um, of this new bud that they tried. And I might be able to say, hey, I'll send you 10 Steam dollars if uh, if you mention my rolling papers or if you roll up, you know, tomorrow's uh, uh, dispensary pick in Rules for Rebels paper. So I'm actually still kind of working on coming up with a name and the branding and everything else. Um, so if I just if I continue to move forward with that, I, I will kind of document the process of doing that. Yeah, Reezy is awesome. And I, I got to hand it to Reezy and, and guys like him who are like doing live streams several times a day who are coming out with a, a ton of content. You know, I'm kind of weird when it comes to YouTube. Something that I've been meaning to focus on in 2018 is kind of mentality. Um, so basically with YouTube, like unless I'm feeling confident, feeling positive, feeling energetic, I have a tough time going on camera and making videos, right? Like nobody wants to watch somebody who's like, hey guys, today we're going to talk about, you know. So I, I like to kind of be in that mindset and I'm kind of a weird or kind of moody person. So unless I'm kind of feeling good, I don't really like to make videos. Um, so I've been meaning, I, I'm meaning to focus on kind of trying to stay in that type of mindset more and kind of trying to get myself out of funks when I fall into them. And kind of a, a good example I give when trying to explain mindset to people is think about on a Friday afternoon when you're coming home from work, like, right? Like you're feeling good. You're like, yeah, you got kind of a bounce in your step. And then think about Mondays, right? We all hear like, oh, you got a case of the Mondays. There's really nothing different, no difference between a Monday and a Friday. It's all mental. Um, so being able to keep yourself in that positive mindset and things all the time. And I think that's kind of why I do less live streams is because when you do a live stream or even a collaboration with somebody, you have to commit to a time, right? So I did a, a video with uh, uh, Thrift Shop Hustler actually recently. And because he's on the West Coast, uh, it wound up being at about 10 o'clock my time. And so earlier in the day, I was like really pumped. I was really psyched. I'm like, I can't wait to do this live stream with them. We had done one previously. It went really well. And, you know, then I ate dinner, hung out with my girlfriend. And then nine o'clock comes around. And when 10 o'clock comes around, 
I'm like, man, I'm kind of tired. I'm not really feeling that personable. Like I really didn't want to go on and do the live stream. And I actually went on. It wound up being a great discussion. I had a great time with it. Uh, but I think that's one thing that kind of holds me back from doing these live streams is I'm having to commit to a time and going live and I'm making the commitment to you guys and somebody else. And my fear is that like the time comes around and I'm like, oh, I really don't feel like doing this right now. So mindset um, is something that I've really been meaning to kind of focus on in 2018. Let's see what else we got. Yeah, that's another thing. Somebody, Lauren Cole City Loot said hit the like button. So I don't know if you guys watch Super Man, but Super Man is famous for smash that like button, smash that like button. And that's one other thing about YouTube in terms of growing your subscribership, getting upvotes, getting subscribers you have to ask for it, right? It's called a call to action. Um, and what a call to action is basically asking people to do things. And just to give you an example of how powerful a call to action is, I, I was a communications major in college. So I took some classes in like mass media and broadcasting and things like that. And there are actually very specific rules about calls to action on a radio. I don't know what is it, the FTC or FCC makes these rules, but call to actions are so powerful that the government actually has to regulate what you can use them for. Um, so by just saying, Hey guys, I'd appreciate it. If you subscribe to my channel, the chance of you subscribing goes up to something like 70 plus percent. So, um, if you want to get likes, if you want to get subscribers, ask for them. Uh, a lot of people do it at the beginning of the video, because I know a lot of times not everybody sticks through till the end of the video. And even we all kind of know when a YouTube video is, is kind of fizzling out towards the end. Um, and a lot of people kind of tune out. So a lot of people ask for that at the beginning, but yeah, th thank you for mentioning that. I think it was Lauren. Um, call to actions are incredibly important uh, and very effective as well. Uh, partnering with channels. Jay Couple, I worked with a record label that would put artists, artwork, and cover albums on rolling paper packs for promo purposes. That's actually a really cool idea. It's kind of, I don't know if you'd call that culture hacking, but also like, okay, so if I have a rolling paper company, I have to get people to basically support my company. But if I get, I don't know, Keller Williams or um, I'm like thinking I like jam bands because that would definitely lend itself. But if I get some band to put their artwork on, on my rolling papers or whatever, somebody who's a fan of like Keller Williams will probably roll buy my rolling papers for no other purpose than the fact that Keller Williams artwork or logo artwork is on there. Um, and that's one thing that I just in terms of this is just kind of a cool idea I had. I know a lot of people who have YouTube channels do like mail day things where people will mail things in or they might show off like some of their subscribers artwork or whatever else. So I just have kind of a lot of random stuff back here. I've been meaning to kind of redesign my little spare bedroom, guest room slash studio. Uh, but one thing I was thinking about doing, I know a lot of you guys are like t-shirt designers and artists and things like that. So as a way to kind of get you guys more engaged as well as one of the things I wanted to do with starting my YouTube channel is help put people on. Um, so, you know, a lot of times like a Mitchie boy or Mitchie B, he, he works really hard on, on YouTube and Steam it and things like that. So a lot of times I'll try to get get him give him a mention to kind of get people over there. Like if you guys have businesses you're trying to launch, um, I think of us all as being kind of a family or a community here. So if you have a new product out, if you want to send one in to me, you know, I'd be happy to show it on the channel and maybe get you a little bit of buzz, right? We, we have this big community. We have this big audience. And I think we can kind of help each other out. So if any of you guys are artists, I was going to invite you guys to send in some of your art and maybe I'll make it part of my backdrop and I'll mention so-and-so designed this. Um, those of you guys who are t-shirt designers, I was going to start giving you the guys the opportunity to send t-shirts into me. It's good for me. I love t-shirts. I get some free t-shirts. And I was thinking about doing something like Goofy T-Shirt Tuesday or something, but I'll wear one of your guys' t-shirts and, and mention kind of who designed it, what it's about, and where people can buy it. So uh, I have a P.O. box for my business, or I should say I have a mailing address for my business, different from my office. I wanted to get a separate one for YouTube just to kind of keep it separate from that. But I will work on getting like a P.O. box. So if you guys want to send in your products, your artwork, your T-shirts, whatever, um, I'd love to kind of plug you guys and try to help you guys out as well. So I thought that might be kind of a cool thing for, for audience engagement. Um, market is saturated. Uh, Munchie, I don't know if you're talking about like rolling papers being saturated. I, it, in some ways, I agree. I mean, there's websites that sell like 100 different types of rolling papers, but it's all about how you come at it, right? Like I have a pretty big audience. I think a lot of you guys maybe smoke a little bit of bud too. Um, and I think my kind of image with the whole man bun and surfboard and everything kind of fits that. But I think if you have a following, if you have an audience, you can launch anything. Um, 
what's really big right now is stories and, and content marketing. So I, I think I could probably succeed with the uh, with the rolling paper thing if I came about it in my own way and from my own angle. Although I would agree it's a, it's a competitive space. Um, yeah. Anyhow, guys, I, I appreciate all of you guys tuning in. Um, again, we kind of talked about YouTube. This YouTube channel would be nothing without you guys. It would be me just talking to myself in my car and, and here in my uh, my guest bedroom here. So I can't express uh, my, my gratitude enough for you guys all kind of supporting me. Those of you guys who are newer, as well as those of you who have been here from the beginning. Um, it's really been an amazing journey to 70,000 subscribers. And what kind of makes getting that silver play button even more valuable to me is because I don't really think of myself as a YouTuber, because I don't really think of myself as a, an online personality or an outgoing person, like it's that much more of a challenge for me to do something like that. So I think that's why it's become such a, such an obsession for me. But I, I greatly appreciate all your guys' support um, just in general, as well as kind of making it to that goal. And man, it's going to be like, uh, a five-year thing in the works, but I'm going to be kind of, you know, to a uh, hundred thousand subscribers to a lot of people is like nothing like, Oh, I got that in six months. But to me, that would be a, a really big deal. So I really appreciate all, all your guys subscriberships and it'll be kind of a huge, uh, huge feat. You know, I've had some success in e-commerce and entrepreneurship and some other things, but that would be one thing uh, that's kind of a little bit outside of my comfort zone. That's something that's more of a challenge for me. And it'd be something that I'd be really, really proud of. So, uh, Hey, Johnny, I would love to send one of my black and white photographs for the wall. Definitely put that up. Okay, so yeah, I, I'll work on it. I've been saying this for like months, and I haven't gotten around to it, but I'll definitely get a get an address that you guys can, can mail some stuff into, and I'll try to kind of promote and plug kind of your guys' shirts and photography and artwork and projects and things like that as well. So uh, do you know when you will be doing one of these again? You know, I'll tell you what, one of my goals for 2018 was going to be to do either a live stream or a collaboration at least once a month. I know that's a pretty low goal or a pretty low bar, but it's something that's definitely outside of my comfort zone. When it comes to goal setting, I think a lot of times if you shoot too high, things are overwhelming or intimidating and you wind up getting nothing done. Uh, so I decided to set the, the bar low, hit that, build some confidence and continue doing it. So I will be doing these at least once a month. What I was thinking about doing is even if we don't do a, a multi-hour long thing, whenever I do live streams, I wind up having a great time and staying on for forever. And because it's kind of something outside my comfort zone, I'm like super pumped when I get done with them. So the last couple have been really late at night and I'm normally drinking coffee and I'm like super hyped that I, I did it and I did a good job when I get off. So like a lot of times after a live stream, I can't even sleep. And because they go so long, I wind up being like hoarse for like days afterwards or having a sore throat. Uh, but one thing I was going to start doing is maybe doing like a weekly, even if it's only 10 or 15 minutes, doing like a weekly 10 or 15 minute Q&A about like an ask me anything, or maybe we could focus them on like different subject matters. Um, I've got the one set up for doctors over the phone to get meta MJ cards with the possibility of connecting and company email at the project where I could just uh, Diane, you know, I, I actually knew somebody who was doing something similar. Like right now, like I was actually going to make a video about the, uh, the medical marijuana or even recreational marijuana business. And it's a really tough one, uh, legally to get into. I'm involved in a business that is like a, a license, a business that you need to be like licensed and registered for. And what's great about those types of businesses is there's a really steep barrier to entry and it's really profitable because of that. One of the challenges of those types of businesses is dealing with the government and any type of like legal stuff, registration is a huge nightmare. You can wind up with big fines and things like that. Um, so I actually had had a buddy who started a business that was basically designed to help people get uh, medical marijuana cards. And I think they charge $150, $250. And they would basically get you the paperwork for your state, uh, put you in contact with the doctor. I think they'd pay the doctor $250. The doctor would keep $150 of it and $100 would get kicked back to them. So that's kind of a, a nice way to be involved in the industry without actually having to be in the industry. Um, also, when it comes to a lot of things, you know, like they say with the gold rush, don't be the one mining for gold, be the one selling shovels and pickaxes because those are the guys who are always guaranteed to make money. Uh, but that's an interesting business. I was actually meaning to make a video about maybe like the marijuana industry, whatever, just kind of an interesting off topic thing. Uh, DARE, you know, the DARE program, most of you guys probably went through it in third grade or fifth grade. They just recently removed uh, marijuana as a gateway drug from their thing. So no more of this like scaremongering. We get into a whole nother discussion about how when you treat marijuana as the same thing as heroin, you take away kids fears of drugs and, you know, the whole gateway drug thing. Marijuana isn't a gateway drug any more than soda pop is. It's just that when it's an illegal black market thing, the same guy who sells weed, sells mushrooms or ecstasy or cocaine, 
So when you go to pick up your eighth of weed, hey, you know, I got this. You want some of this? And that's why the whole gateway drug thing came about. This, obviously, this isn't a discussion about uh, marijuana policy or anything like that. But just, uh, I don't know, got me thinking about the whole, like, marijuana industry. Obviously, marijuana, recreational marijuana, medical marijuana is like a multi-billion dollar industry. It's only going to get bigger. It's gaining more acceptance. And I've always thought it was kind of weird how, like, you can have a passion for wine or like spirits or beers and craft beer brewing, brewing and things like that without being like an alcoholic or a drunkard. But you really can't be into like weed without being a pothead, right? Like there's kind of a disconnect there. Uh, but yeah, really kind of an interesting uh, business. Maybe we'll touch on that in another uh, another episode. But uh, we've gotten a little bit off track here, but it, it's been awesome chatting with you guys. Again, thank you everybody for the support. Um, I'll try to do more of these live streams in the future. My girlfriend's going to kill me. She's going to be starving and she's going to say it's bad for metabolism eating this late. So I got to get running. Thank you guys so much for watching. Please give the video a thumbs up if you enjoy it. Subscribe if you're not subscribed. And if there's anything I didn't touch on, drop a comment in the comment section below. I'll be sure to respond to you guys. Thanks for watching. And I'll catch you later.